Hello and welcome to the IA School of Thought series with me, Sai Kamal. School of Thought is our weekly show on classical liberal thought, looking at different strands of thought within classical liberalism, where we discuss leading classical liberal thinkers and apply some of these ideas to current issues. The show is inspired by the IA book School of Thought, 101 Great Liberal Thinkers by Eamon Butler, which, as the title suggests, summarises the thoughts of leading classical liberal thinkers on a range of issues, including politics, government, social institutions, capitalism, rights, liberty, and morality. But before we get started, please do check out all our online content on the IA YouTube channel, IA London. And don't forget to subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin to make sure you don't miss out on any of our fascinating and thought-provoking content. Now, today's featured thinker is John Stuart Mill, described by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as the most influential English language philosopher of the 19th century. To others, he's known as one of the most influential liberal thinkers. To discuss his life and work, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Chris Snowden, who is the head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Chris, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Pleasure. How are you doing? I'm fine. Um, now, you've chosen um, John Stuart Mill, J.S. Mill, to discuss with me today. Why did you choose him? Can you explain why? Do he have a profound impact on you specifically? Is, it some, is there something that you admire about him? Or was there something that he, you, you felt that he said or wrote that shaped our thinking? Uh, well, all those things, really. Um, the, the book that particularly inspires me is, is On Liberty, probably his most famous book. Um, because it touches on, well, it more, more than touch on it, it, it beautifully uh, elaborates the arguments for uh, two things I think are very important. One, individual freedom, and the other is free speech. And these are timeless themes. I guess I first became really aware of Mill's work in my first year at university. I did a one-year course in politics um, in my first year at university. And if I remember correctly, the first four weeks of lectures were given over to uh, the, the great political thinkers. So there was one about Mill, there was one about Marx, there was one, I think, perhaps about Rousseau. I'm not quite sure who the other one was, maybe Locke or Bentham or somebody. I only really remember the one about Mill um, because I, I, having not previously read On Liberty, on, on not really known much about Mill, it was the only one of those four lectures where I felt I was just simply being given the facts. You know, it didn't feel to me as if I was just being given an explanation of what somebody thought. I mean, just everything seemed to me self-evidently true and it just helped to crystallize what I already thought essentially. Um, and it didn't really occur to me that there'd be anybody who would even disagree with it. Um, and, it's a book I've read you know, several times since. It's fortunately nice and, nice and short, beautifully written, very clear. Um, I've written about it as well. I mean, my book Killjoys kind of centers around Mill's argument on individual liberty and his opposition to paternalism. Um, and I just think the arguments in it are basically perfect, pretty much. And I've read lots of uh, books discussing him and people trying to kick at the ideas and suggest, well, what about this? What about that? Isn't there an inconsistency here? And it nearly always comes down to kind of pedantry and sophistry, as far as I can see. Um, any kind of flaws in the work, I think, are extremely minor. And the basic argument in it, the, 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 um, the opposition to the tyranny of the majority, and the harm principle, especially, that says that, um, effectively, that the, the law shouldn't be intervening when um, somebody is just putting themselves at some risk, they have to be harming the persons or property of others. That principle, which Mill didn't really invent, he just very nicely described, you know, he didn't, he didn't invent liberalism. A lot of what he was talking about was already part of the English common law tradition. Um, but he just defined it and explained it better than anybody has uh, since and, and, and had be before. And I think it's an abs absolutely fun fundamental idea. It's a fundamental idea to all liberal democracies. And I think most people, whether they're aware of Mill's work or not, basically agree with what he was saying. And, and colloquial phrases like, your right to swing your fist ends at my nose, is really just another way of describing what, uh, or, or saying what Mill was saying with the harm principle. Is there anything particularly that he wrote or said that makes him stand out for you? Or is it just all those things all put together, as it were? 
It's that one book. I mean, to be honest, I haven't read much of his other work. I've read a little bit of um, his uh, Principles of Political Economy. Uh, I know he wrote uh, a book, The Subjugation of, of Women, which is very far ahead of its time, but I must admit I haven't actually read it myself. You know, he, he was ahead of his, his time in, in, in many respects, um, but he also defined uh and and in, encapsulated really you know some of the defining ideas of his own time of 19th century liberalism uh, and he had some quite odd ideas you know i agree with everything he said in non liberty i don't agree with everything he said about everything um his views on colonialism for example fairly suspect i mean they were of they were of their time but he, he didn't think that his ideas about individual freedom uh, necessarily applied to what he called the barbarians um, I didn't. I don't agree with his views on, um, on on taxation. Not all of them, at least. I think some of them are pretty good. I don't agree um, with his rather eccentric view about democracy, which is that there shouldn't be a secret ballot; that people should be prepared to stand up and say who they voted for. So I don't agree with him um, on everything. On liberty, absolutely, is 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 the key text, almost by default, because it's the one I've been reading and rereading for. Um, for so many years, but I think there's a reason it's is it's his most famous work. Um, he was famous. I mean, you rightly described him as the the dominant uh, political thinker of of the 19th century. I think that's absolutely right. Only only Marx can could rival him in terms of legacy, and obviously Mill's legacy was rather more positive than um, than, than Marx's was. But you know, on liberty, it has themes in it that need to be explained again and again to first year students in lecture halls because they are timeless and they are in incredibly important. And I often worry that we are uh, slipping away from them, that there is a danger of the tyranny, tyranny of the majority. Mill definitely had his concerns about um, extending the franchise. He did embrace extending the franchise and indeed he, he wanted women to have the vote you know, decades before they did get the vote, but he had concerns. Uh, which he felt could mainly be overcome by education. He was very, very interested and, and passionate about giving everybody a good education. But he felt that without that, there would be this um, huge danger of laws being set on the basis of the whim uh, of a kind of transient democratic majority, people being led by demagogues and ignorance. Um, and I think that is a legitimate fear, you know, and I guess what he was doing in, in on liberty, he was setting limits on what the government can do. And just because you're in a democracy, it doesn't mean that the government can do anything at all. And again, this obviously wasn't a new idea. The founding fathers of America had, had uh, laid out the Constitution very much with that in mind. So, you, you know, he clearly, as you say, talked about the concerns over sort of tyrann tyrannical majorities. Um, but he's also known for his thoughts on utilitarianism, you know, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Um, is, do, do, do you see any sort of uh, potential uh, contradiction or conflict there? And I, I suppose the other thing I want to ask you about utilitarianism is all about happiness. And, you know, you're known as the sort of head of lifestyle economics at the IA, uh, you know, telling government to get out of the way of people, you know, who know the dangers or know the, con know the risks of smoking or drinking, but just want to get on with their life and be happy. Is, did, that, did he influence you in that way as well? Well, uh, there's a, a couple of different questions in there. I mean, yeah. yeah, he started off as a utilitarian. His father, James Mill, was a was a very famous utilitarian, and he was great friends with, with Jeremy Bentham, the most famous of them all. Um, Mill moved away from that, you know, l later in his life, without a shadow of a doubt. By the time he wrote On Liberty, he, he was definitely um, espousing a... a more than subtly different version of utilitarianism. And I think rightly so. You know, I've never really been a, a utilitarian as such um, because as far as I can see, it, it will tolerate some people suffering more so long as you know, a large number of people benefit. In theory, at least, that's what could happen. Um, now, economics is utilitarianism in the broadest sense. It's a shame that words like utility have come to mean almost the opposite of what people like Bentham meant them to mean. Utilitarianism now sounds like um, something based around a very cold calculating, ca calculating machine, which it was never meant to be. It was meant to be literally the science of happiness. And economics, in a sense, is a science of happiness because we want to maximize people's utility. We want to maximize happiness in, in a society. Um, but because of that danger, that in theory at least, and I think probably in practice, um, the greatest number of people could become happy by 
oppressing a, a small minority of people. You could use possibly slavery as an example of that conceivably. Um, I think that's where it falls down as a moral philosophy. And Mill moved away from that and he looked more at actually defending minorities. One of the real themes of, of On Liberty is his defense of minorities, of, um, of nonconformists, of eccentrics. Uh, Mill, Mill was something of an eccentric uh, himself. And of genius. He, he felt that there was a kind of uh, direct connection between the, um, the amount of ex eccentricity in a society and the amount of genius and he felt that you could only have eccentricity by allowing people to have different uh, experiments in living as he would have said so um the, he, he definitely moved away from utilitarianism i think rightly so um but not entirely i mean he still he was still a utilitarian consequentialist the arguments for liberty weren't based around natural rights or something like that. They were based on utilitarian grounds that you will actually get the best outcomes in a society if you allow individual freedom. And so his defense of free speech, for example, was not based on some God-given right to say and write what you want. It was actually that everybody will benefit by allowing free speech because even the worst opinions, A, might turn out to be true, and B, are useful in the society because it allows the correct opinions to prove themselves to be right and to be strengthened. So he was actually taking a, a more sort of societal view. He, it wasn't a kind of selfish individualism by any means. Um, he used several different arguments in On Liberty to say that actually it's you, it's you, the masses, who might not, you don't think you've got anything to fear by um, the tyranny majority because you are in the majority. You don't think you have anything to fear from uh, clampdowns on free speech because you're never going to say anything that's particularly controversial but you will actually benefit yourselves if you allow eccentric or minority opinions to flourish well, we talked about um uh well you, talk, you talked about bentham and you talked about obviously his father um a bit, a bit being influences on him do we know who else he was influenced by and, and who helped shape his, his thoughts and his ideas well, he was friends with some of the, the, the great figures of his day, uh, Comte, um, Tocqueville in particular, who of course was French um, aristocrat who went to America. Uh, and, and Mill himself was uh, almost saw himself as a, a, a conduit between kind of post revolutionary French uh, political thinking and um, the rather different political thinking that, that was um, prevalent in, in England. I mean, he like a lot of people like this, you know, he, he was a genuinely kind of international man of letters. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was primarily influenced originally, I guess, by, by his father and, and by Bentham. But I mean, this is somebody who, who wrote, uh, who, sorry, who read so incredibly widely, um, that it's, you know, uh, who wouldn't he have been influenced by, you know, he, his father actually brought him up more or less, um, consciously to become a genius. Um, he, he kept him away from other children. He got him reading ancient Greek at the age of three. By the age of eight, he was reading entire books in ancient Greek. Um, his kind of uh, free time as a small child was to read somewhat more lighthearted books like Robinson Crusoe, you know? Uh, so this is somebody who was driven very, very hard to, um, to become a very great, person you know um so much so that you know he, he more or less had a midlife crisis when he was 20 years old he was already working for the east india company when he was 17 he was distributing pro contraception uh, pro contraception literature um at the age of of 17 it was he actually got arrested for that at that age so he'd done a huge amount by the time he was in his late teens um, and he had read an enormous amount i mean he was just an extremely clever guy he was also in my opinion i, I probably most people's opinion know anything about him um a genius as far as you can you can define what that means um so yeah he was influenced by a huge number of people including of course his wife harriet who um you know he'd known for many many years before uh, her husband died and a couple of years later uh, they, they got married um but she you know by, by mill's own admission was a, a enormous influence on him, not just with the, the feminine, feminism stuff and subjugation of women, but um, in his thoughts uh, about uh, liberty and all sorts of other issues as well. Now, we, we look back at him and we, as, as we both said, that he's seen as one of the most influential philosophers of the 19th century. 
But was he someone whose ideas were widely adopted at the time, or did he struggle to be heard? And, and do we, did people look back later, in later years uh, and uh, revere him? You know, how long did it take for his ideas to be uh, widely spread? Well, he was you know, acknowledged at the time as a, as a great man. I think he would probably be acknowledged in his lifetime as Britain's foremost um, yeah, intellectual economist, political thinker, well, however you want to you know, look at it. He, he, he was a, a, a master of several different trades. You know, his book about economic, uh, economics was the set text for decades after his death until, until after the, the First World War. Um, so yeah, he was renowned in his own time. Um, he was an MP as well. You know, he did so many things. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, to what extent were his ideas adopted? Well, a lot of them were. Um, I mean, a lot of them kind of already had been. He was just explaining why they were important, why it was important to conserve them. Um, we're free trade. He was against the Corn Laws, um, so in, in, in that respect, he was successful. There, he was rather young, I guess, at the time when he was opposed to the, the Corn Laws. He was he was against slavery, um, pro free trade, even though he worked for the East India Company. Um, he he was on the right side of a lot of arguments, and he won a lot of arguments, but he lost a lot of arguments too. Um, he obviously lost on the, um, the women's suffrage issue for example, and with some of his other ideas, perhaps it's a good job that he, he didn't succeed. Um, in the long term, it's, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, it depends how much you think that we are respecting the freedom of the individual and free speech today. I think for a good hundred years um, after he wrote On Liberty, in, in large parts, particularly of the English-speaking world, uh, his ideas were absolutely central you know i think they are fundamental ideas and have been fundamental ideas for a very long time and, and very few people are prepared to knock them you know this is the interesting thing even the most blatant de de you know, despots and dictators have still paid lip service to to the concepts that uh, mill laid out there and again i don't want to give mill all the credit for the you know for inventing the idea of individual freedom but because he, he, he didn't but um Almost nobody is prepared to say that freedom is a bad thing. Individual liberty is wrong. Um, and uh, that paternalism is, is great. People don't tend to make these arguments in those terms, even if they are very obviously anti-freedom and very obviously paternalistic. They, at the, the most, will try and just redefine what freedom means or, or to find some evidence of external harm, often very tenuous. So in the area that I, I spend most of my time writing about, nanny state regulation, the most common argument is that, oh, well, we don't, well, I don't mind if people want to smoke themselves to death or drink themselves to death or, or, or get terribly fat, but why should I have to pick up the pieces? It's, you know, it's an external harm to me because I have to pay for their NHS costs. And, and actually, if you look at the economics of that, the it doesn't stack up actually, but people would much rather use even a fairly spurious argument about external costs than just say, I don't like smoking. I don't like people being fat. I think it's bad for them. And I think we should use some kind of coercion to make them change their ways. Now, when you read the history of sort of liberal thought and we, you see the, the sort of it's, you see early classical liberal thought, you see a sort of modern liberalism, the sort of liberalism that people talk about in America these days. And people often ask, why did liberalism go from classical liberalism to modern liberalism? And one person that's often cited, or the work that is cited, is J.S. Mill. Um, can you see why that is? And is, 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 that, is, that, is that a fair analysis of J.S. Mill? You know, as classical liberals, you know, we read on liberty, and you know, he, it, it makes a lot of sense to us. But he's also revered by some modern liberals. And do you understand why that is? I think most of what Mill said kind of crosses the left-right divide. You know, there are plenty of people on the left who are interested in uh, individual freedom and free speech. They maybe have a different way of going about it. Uh, and they, you know, uh, in, in terms of the their economic policies, it might be very different from a classical liberals. But then Mill's own economic policies were, um, you know, they were hardly all libertarian. I mean, he certainly had some a fairly socialist ideas, particularly in the later years of um, his life. So he was no, by no means kind of a right-wing libertarian whatsoever. He, he uh, had a lot of contempt for conservatives, for example. Um, but I think on 
the main issues that he is remembered for, there, there shouldn't be a, a kind of left-right battle over him. He's a little bit like, although to a, to the, he's, he's slightly different. I was going to say Orwell is like a little bit like that. I mean, Orwell was more obviously a left-wing and a socialist than, than Mill. Um, but in terms of what, Orwell, right? You know, in terms of more Orwell's opposition to totalitarianism and his basic human libertarianism, which I, I, is what I get from reading a lot of Orwell, um, it crosses the left-right divide. Even though Orwell was clearly a man um, of the left, so there were things that uh, Orwell said, and certainly a lot of things that, that Mill said, that can be easily um, and without any hypocrisy adopted by people on both left and right. There's no reason, for example, that free speech should be a left or right-wing issue. Yes, in fact, we, we've got a forthcoming book on free speech with a number of chapters uh, from different writers, and we are finding you know, that we've got uh, authors from across the political spectrum. And as you say, free speech shouldn't necessarily be a, a left-right issue. Um, what do you think is the biggest lesson classical liberals today can learn from J.S. Mill's ideas? Uh, well, I mean, I think it should be basically a set text for anybody who calls himself a, a classical liberal. Um, I, I really do. Um, the lessons, if you, if you already consider yourself a classical liberal, you probably already learned the lessons. Um, I think it's a matter of conserving the rights that we have won in a, in a liberal democracy. And it was just the same when, when Mill was writing. You know, he wasn't so much demanding that there were laws that should be torn down, although I think he certainly would have been against something like the um, blasphemy laws, for example. He was much more concerned about what might come along the line. And liberty always has to be defended. And we always have to be vigilant of those who would take it away. And Mill gives us the arguments. And I think it's very important that he gave the arguments, um, you know, they're arguments that you would use to a, a skeptical audience that is self-interested. Uh, this is what I, I mentioned before about how he was trying to suggest that there were positive spillover effects from allowing people to be free. Um, the tyranny of the majority will always be a concern. Um, Mill may be, you know, had he, were he alive today, Mill may be very concerned by the kind of the populist wave that seems to be spreading around so much of the world. I don't think he would be a big fan of Donald Trump. I think he maybe would feel vindicated um, in, in, in his warnings that, that Donald Trump is president, for example. So I just think that the, the arguments need to be um, told and retold and made and remade over and over again. And it's just the same as any of the other great economic, uh, yeah, economists or, or philosophers, just the same as Adam Smith. However obvious some of these arguments may seem to us, however obviously um, beneficial certain rights and liberties might seem to us, you cannot take them for granted. And the case needs to be made again and again for each generation. And in my view, and in the view of quite a few people, um, there is no one better than John Stuart Mill for making the arguments for individual liberty. So let's just keep reusing them. So we're speaking today, uh, and today's recording is, we're, you know, we're in the middle of lockdown um, during, a, uh, during a pandemic. Um, any lessons for, you know, uh, for now as, as we think about government response and individuals' response to the pandemic? Well, what would John Stuart Mill made of, of the lockdown? I mean, it, it's an apples and oranges comparison in a way because he lived in a time when there were far more virulent diseases like this knocking around London and, and killing people. So I suppose in a sense, if he'd literally been uh, taken in a time machine to 2020, he would be amazed at the overreaction. Had he been a man of our time, um, I think he would have understood that the lockdown, I don't think it breaks you know, John Stuart Mill's harm principle actually wrote an article about this for the Telegraph a couple of weeks before the lockdown began, saying that libertarians do not have an objection to even quite draconian or very draconian measures like the lockdown, because there is a threat of external harm there. The, the threat being you could give the virus to me and I could die. That's a real harm. That's a real third party um, harm. And the government is entitled to get involved when there, are, there is, you know, clear and direct arm. So there's nothing I don't think the government has really done that necessarily breaches John Stuart Mill's um, you know, harm principle. And if it had done nothing, I'm sure Mill would have um, said it was doing too little. So yeah, the idea that there's no libertarians in, in a pandemic is, is for the birds. Um, 
and, and people have been saying this the last couple of months, but they, as usual, don't really even seem to understand what libertarian or classical liberal thought is. Uh, you know, it's about intervening when there are market failures uh, and negative externalities uh, and not intervening in cases where those externalities are either extremely tenuous or non-existent. Because, as Mill said himself, the odds are that the government will interfere wrongly in the wrong place. Yes, and as we know, classical liberalism represents a sort of a spectrum of views. You know, classical liberalism themselves disagree over the role of government. Some want a night watchman state, some are anarcho-capitalists and think there should be no role. Others think there are, there's a, definitely a role, especially in emergencies such as this. Look, Chris, if um, someone was going to come to you and say, Chris, you know, you're clearly a, an admirer of J.S. Mill, uh, but why is it? Sum him up in a few sentences, you know, his thoughts and uh, why, you know, why, why you're such an admirer. Sum up why I'm an admirer, or some yeah. of his thoughts. Uh, my, oh. Why I'm an admirer of John Stuart Mill. Um, I think he was a brave man. I think he was a, a manifestly extremely intelligent man. Um, a, um, a, yeah, a very passionate and, and, and caring man, actually. You know, um, He was not just some ivory tower intellectual. He really cared about people. The reason he was handing out uh, pro-contraception literature when he was 17 years old because he was he found a, a dead baby a baby that had been killed by its parents because its parents could not um afford to, to keep it um and he was absolutely heartbroken by that you know um so he cared passionately about about the human race about about the country in which he lived and about other people he wanted people to be lifted up but he didn't believe that the best way for uh, people to improve themselves was for the government to be uh, pushing them around and telling them what was right and wrong. He did at heart believe that individuals, if given the opportunity and if given a modicum of education, were quite capable of improving themselves and finding their own preferred course in life. But it would be a, a course in life that they had chosen, not that somebody else had chosen for them. And it's a very important message to um, be reminded of and, and, and keep pointing out that we are not all the same. And uh, you know, th th there are eccentrics and there are minorities. And if you prevent these people from living the life that they would choose for themselves, then you are doing them real harm. And paternalism itself is very often harmful. Well, Chris, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, note to end on. Thank you very much for joining us today. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, to learn more about John Stuart Mill and, and why you chose him. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone out there who's watching or listening uh, to, uh, uh, to the podcast. Uh, for more information on our publications, our webinars, and our other online content, please visit our website, ia.org.uk. Check out our YouTube channel, IA London. You can listen to our podcast on Podbean or subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin to stay updated on all our activity. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Hope to, to, to see you again soon. Thank you.